All right, in this video, I'm going to be ending this part of the, uh, the critique of pure reason known as the transcendental analytic. And so this is uh, on the Wikipedia for the critique of pure reason. And you can see that the way Kant sort of divides up his, his book is really kind of confusing and uh, a little puzzling. But uh, so the first part was this transcendental aesthetic where we talked about space and time. Then most of what we, well, all of what we've been talking about for the past few videos was this transcendental analytic. Uh, and so we're here at this phenomena in noumena part. And in this video, I'll be talking about what he actually calls an appendix at the end of it, at the end of the transcendental analytic. And then in the next few videos, we'll be getting into this transcendental dialectic, which is kind of where, you know, his critique of reason itself actually really sort of starts. You can almost see a lot of this stuff in the transcendental aesthetic and then in the transcendental analytic as almost being preamble to the transcendental dialectic. And yet it's the... Uh, transcendental aesthetic and analytic that sort of gets most of the attention in a lot of uh, Kant scholarship. Uh, the transcendental dialectic, I mean, you know, there's obviously stuff that gets talked about, but uh, it's not as uh, focused on by Kant scholars as the transcendental aesthetic in the transcendental analytic. Uh, but anyway, like I said, in this video, uh, we'll be talking about what Kant calls the amphiboly of the concepts of reflection. Uh, so this, as I said, is the end of the transcendental analytic. And I did not know what amphiboly meant, so I had to go on dictionary.com and look it up. Uh, and so an amphiboly is an ambiguity of speech, especially from uncertainty of the grammatical construction rather than the meaning of the words. And so it's this amphiboly of the concepts of reflection. So Kant says that reflection uh, is essentially sort of looking at different things, uh, well, things like in this table, and sort of placing them either in the intuition or in the understanding. And Kant says that, uh, that Leibniz in particular uh, a lot of his metaphysics is a mistake of putting things in the sort of wrong faculties. In fact, this this whole uh, appendix to the transcendental analytic, this uh, amphiboly of the concepts of reflection is, it's about, I think it's 20 pages long, and pretty much the entire thing is just Kant dunking on Leibniz. Uh, and so... You know, that's kind of what this chapter looks like. And so uh, Kant uh, is looking at these different divisions, so things like identity and difference, uh, and sort of puts uh, each one into a different uh, faculty that he has been talking about, the intuition or the understanding. The intuition being the, you know, the form of our experiences, like space and time and understanding being the the categories of understanding so the the various concepts and so identity and difference so difference two objects that look identical but occupy a different place in space time and uh, understanding identity two objects falling under an identical concept and so in black here is right from the critique so if the object is appearance then a comparison of the concepts is of no consequence and though everything may be identical with regard to concepts, yet the difference of place of these appearances at the same time is sufficient ground for admitting a numerical difference. And so this, uh, I mean, everything in this table, so Kant doesn't make this table, I kind of put it into a table, uh, goes back to something I talked about in like the very first video in this playlist, and that's this idea that we have... Uh, that we have the the general, or we could say, uh, you know, the, 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 well, I'll just say the general, or the genera, or the genus, and then we have the particular, 
the particular. And so the general, so the particular has all of the sort of, um, the sort of things that the general says. So for instance, you know, the general being mammal would say, you know, warm blooded, lactates, you know, contains hair follicles. And so every particular, every, you know, animal, every even individual creature that falls under mammal will have those, um, those traits, those uh, properties. But the particular will also have new properties, you know, so the general being mammal, uh, the particular could be dog. And so uh, dogs have, you know, all of the things that mammals have, but then additional things uh, in, in addition to mammal, which, you know, is what makes them into dogs. And so, uh, so Kant is talking about, so two objects falling under an identical concept. Uh, so, you know, two different breeds of dog fall under the concept of, of mammal, for instance. Uh, but then, you know, if we're looking, uh, I mean, say we're look, we say the general is the concept of dog, and then particular is, you know, two particular actual dogs. And so the two dogs being under dog, under the concept of dog, you know, have all of the properties of dog. And so just looking at those properties, those general properties, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between each of the two dogs. Uh, it's only because the two objects uh, that look identical, that both, you know, fall under that concept of dog, occupy a different place in space and time that we actually differentiate them. Uh, and, you know, of course, we could go more more particular than dog. We could say different breeds of dog and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you can sort of place things in general and particular relative to each other at different levels. But, you know, this is just sort of as an illustration. Uh, and so Kant uh, talks about agreement and opposition. And I don't know, I find his agreement and opposition thing kind of strange. Uh, so we can see over here, when reality is represented by the pure understanding, that no opposition can be conceived between realities. That is, no relation such that when combined in one subject, they should annihilate the consequence of each other, such as 3 minus 3 equals 0. And so Kant says that uh, in, you know, in our experience, what we would see this sort of annihilation of each other is if we had, you know, this block here, uh, sort of pushing with a force this way, but then we had another block sort of, you know, right next to it of equal mass pushing that way. There would be no movement uh, going on there. And so the the forces of them are sort of canceling each other out. Uh, and so that's what we have over here. One thing annihilates the other, such as two objects pushing on each other with equal but opposite force. Uh, and so, I don't know, I find Kant's idea of this agreement and opposition uh, and the difference that he puts between sort of the intuition and the understanding to be sort of confusing. And in fact, he he doesn't even really give, you know, what an example of this might be in the understanding. And in fact, in this, he kind of says that it doesn't happen in the understanding. And so uh, I'm not going to really talk about that one too much. Uh, so inner and outer, so outer objects are in relation to each other in space time. That's why it's falling under intuition here. Uh, and so inner, so a mind with its inner representations not being in a spatio-temporal relation to each other. And so that's the idea that you could be sitting in one place and, you know, thinking about a ton of different things at a ton of different places. And, you know, there isn't anything actually in space or time in that way. Uh, so the mind is sort of this, uh, this inner thing. And so... Uh, Kant says, what other inner accidents can I think of except those which my own inner sense presents to me, namely something which is either itself a thinking. Uh, and so that's actually how it's phrased in the book, a thinking uh, or analogous to it. And so then he has matter and form. Uh, and so this, I'm not going to read through everything here. I'll just kind of read my own uh, 
in blue comments here. And Kant's philosophy, space and time precedes the content of an intuition. In the intellectualist philosophy of Leibniz, it, it had to be matter that came first in order to be determined as a particular form. Uh, and then matter, if the pure understanding had access to the thing in itself, then matter would come first. Uh, so we can see that this matter and form uh, is really in this, you know, Aristotelian school of the, the four causes of, you know, the, the matter, the form, and then, uh, you know, the, the actual cause, like we usually think of it, you know, like a, a ball hitting another ball, and then the uh, teleological cause, which is like the purpose of something, but uh, Kant is here talking about the matter and form. All right, and so, like I said, in this uh, section in this appendix of the transcendental analytic uh, Kant is as I said dunking on Leibniz for about 20 pages and so I'm actually going to go through a bit of uh, Leibniz's philosophy here just so we can understand uh, what Kant is saying and so everything in purple here uh, actually comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of philosophy and so that's the link right there uh, so this is on the the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy about Leibniz all right so if we're looking at this idea of identity and difference so in this uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article so X is a substance if and only if X has a complete individual concept CIC that is a concept that contains within it all predicates of X past, present, and future. The complete individual concept then serves to individuate substances. It is able to pick out its bearer from an infinity of other finite created substances. Uh, and so that's this idea that, uh, you know, we have a, a particular thing. Uh, so, you know, just so, sort of any general particular thing. And so everything that we predicate of it, so, you know, is a is a x is a y you know is a z so once you have sort of a a full index of all of these predicates uh, then you have a complete description of the object uh, and so um, in this so Leibniz actually uses Alexander the Great so God seeing Alexander's individual nos notion of uh, hesiety, which is uh, sort of a scholastic idea of thisness, uh, which is that which makes a thing what it is, sees in it at the same time the basis and reason for all the predicates which can be said truly of him. Uh, and so in this instance, we could say that uh, this cube is sort of representing Alexander the Great. And so, you know, we are talking about things about Alexander. So uh, the concept of Alexander contains being a king, being a student of Aristotle, conquering Darius and Porus. So uh, his conquest of the Achaemenid Persian Empire and so on. So all of the things that you can sort of... Uh, predicate or ascribe to uh, Alexander the Great. So once you have sort of a full index of those, then you have a complete description of Alexander the Great. Uh, and so Leibniz concludes this section in the celebrated uh, doctrine of marks and traces. When we consider carefully the connection of things, we can say that from all time in Alexander's soul, there are vestiges of everything that has happened to him and marks of everything that will happen to him, and even traces of everything that happens in the universe, even though God alone could recognize them all. And so it's essentially saying that, uh, you know, even Alexander the Great at, you know, some T1 in his life also contains the you know, the full description of him contains everything about him, even at some time in the future, T2, or some time in the future, T0. And so, in sort of a timeless way, all of the things that you could predicate of Alexander the Great was always true at him at every point in his life, even though if 
only God would be able to know all of the things that were true of him. So even at time T1, God might know everything about Alexander at time T2. Uh, and so, you know, God is the one who knows everything about Alexander the Great at any point in his life, even about future things about him. And so the doctrine of Marx and Traces, therefore, claims that because the complete individual concept contains all predicates true of a substance past, present, and future, the entire history of the universe can be read, if only by God, in the essence of an, any individual substance. Uh, the consequences that Leibniz draws from the logical conception of substance and the doctrine of Marx and Traces are remarkable. In the following section in the Discourses, on metaphysics, we are told they include the following. Uh, and so I bolded number one here because this is the one that uh, Kant is going to be sort of going after here. And it's this idea that no two substances can resemble each other completely and be distinct. Uh, and so that goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where if we have sort of the, the general thing, the general concept of of dogs, that should be an O, dogs, and then we want to talk about two particular dogs. Uh, if we, I mean, you know, and we could even say this is even more particular here, so, so breed of dogs. So we have a particular breed of dogs, which is our general concept, and then we have, you know, dog X and dog Y. They would both have everything predicated of each other they would both have all of, you know, the, the mammal things, all of the dog things, all of this particular breed of dog things predicated of them. And so there would be no way of actually distinguishing between the two. So no two substances can resemble each other completely and be distinct. So if each of these dogs have all of this uh, complete individual concept in uh, in common with each other, then they cannot be distinguished from each other. All right, so Leibniz is telling us that each finite substance is the result of a different perspective that God can take of the universe, and that each created substance is an emanation of God. Uh, and so, uh, first, since God could occupy any and all points of view of the universe, there must be a simple substance to represent the world from that perspective. Uh, and this will be, you know, uh, Leibniz's idea of the monads. Uh, second, the stronger God's omniscience entails knowledge of the world from every perspective simultaneously in the infinite perspective of the world originating from God's nature, simply our monads. And so this up here that I have in bold, uh, so from Wikipedia, the, it's now often called the identity of indiscernibles, is the ontological principle that states that there cannot be separate objects or entities that have all their properties in common. That is, entities X and Y are identical if every predicate possessed by X is also possessed by Y and vice versa. So now we get to what Kant says about all this. Uh, and so Kant says, as he, and he here is Leibniz, uh, considered only their concepts, not their position in intuition, uh, in which alone objects can be given, and took no account of the transcendental place. Uh, so the transcendental place, uh, Kant says, is the sort of uh, which faculty, intuition, or understanding that something belongs to uh, of these concepts, whether the object is to be counted among appearances or among things in themselves. It could not happen otherwise than that he could extend his principle of indiscernibles, which is what Kant calls the identity of indiscernibles, which is only valid for concepts of things in general, also objects of the senses. Uh, and so essentially what that is saying is that uh, that Leibniz was only using the concepts of understanding. So when we, you know, have our object here and we're talking about, you know, all of the things that we can predicate of it uh, is X, you know, is Y, uh, is Z. These are all things that we know from the understanding. So all these things that we predicate of it. Uh, and so this is sort of the idea of the understanding sort of reaching beyond what it can to try to get at objects in themselves. Uh, but uh, Kant is saying that 
we also have to take into consideration the intuition, uh, which says, you know, if we have these two objects and, you know, Leibniz says because they uh, all have the, they both have all of these same predicates, uh, they all have the complete individual concept, then we can't discern the difference between them. But Kant is saying that, well, actually, because this is, you know, over here in space, and this is over there in space, uh, we can uh, discern the difference between them. And so Kant is saying that this, uh, that that Leibniz only focusing on the sort of intuition aspect of it is how he could come up with this, uh, this, well, I guess amphiboly here that, that, uh, that uh, of the identity of indiscernibles uh, and so, or what Kant calls the principle of indiscernibles. And so Kant is saying that this is an amphiboly because we are sort of mistaking this sort of, uh, this sort of understanding, this sort of faculty of understanding. We're placing things in the faculty of understanding when we should be placing it in the faculty of intuition. Uh, and so Kant then looks at Leibniz's philosophy in this sort of inner and outer uh, way of thinking about things. And so uh, up here, this sort of lighter purple is actually a quote right from uh, Leibniz. And so now, first of all, it is very evident that created substances depend upon God who preserves them and who even produces them continually by a kind of emanation, just as we produce our thoughts. For God, so to speak, turns on all sides and in all ways the general system of phenomena which he finds it good to produce in order to manifest his glory and he views all the faces of the world in all possible in all ways possible so whoops uh uh yeah so in all po all ways possible since there is no relation that escapes his omniscience the result of each view of the universe as seen from a certain position is a substance which expresses the universe in conformity with this view should God see fit to render his thought actual and to produce substance. Uh, so then uh, the author of the um, of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says, this is a striking passage from Leibniz's Discourse on Metaphysics. Leibniz is telling us that each finite substance is the result of a different perspective that God can take of the universe, and that each created substance is an emanation of God. The argument here can be expressed in several different ways. First, since God could occupy any and all points of view of the universe, there must be a simple substance, uh, which we know will be the monads, to represent the world from that perspective. And since the simple substance must have representations, so the simple substance must have representations of its unique perspective, it must be a mind-like substance, a monad capable of having perception. Second and stronger, God's omniscience entails knowledge of the world from every perspective simultaneously, and the infinite perspectives of the world originated from God's nature simply are monads. And so this is that idea in Leibniz's philosophy that, uh, you know, each monad, uh, so we have this monad, so everything, you know, out here is outer from it. But the monad contains inside of it a sort of representation of the entire universe. And so each monad uh, contains sort of the a representation of the entire universe within it uh, in the same way that like a human mind can contain sort of a representation of, you know, the entire world of it. So these monads uh, must be uh, sort of uh, well, they must contain mind, and uh, so Leibniz is essentially saying that they contain, you know, God's mind. So Kant says, the simple, therefore, is the foundation of what is inner in things in themselves. That which is inner in the state of substances, however, cannot consist in place, 
shape, contact, or motion, all these determinations being outer relations. And we cannot therefore ascribe to substances any other inner state but that through which we ourselves internally determine or sense, namely the state of representations. In such a way the monads were completed. They were to form the basic substances of the whole universe, but their active force consists only in representations, whereby they are, strictly speaking, efficacious merely within themselves. Uh, and so Kant is essentially saying that uh, that because these only contain representations that uh, that they can't say anything about the external world of relations and things like that because the inner, as I said, doesn't actually contain real relations. You know, sort of that idea that in your mind you can sort of, you know, zip around between space and time in your mind, you know, back to your memories of, you know, early childhood to yesterday. And there's not any, like, real relation between them. Those are all just sort of inner relations, and they're not actually real relations. And so Kant also talks about space and time. Uh, so thus it happened that Leibniz conceived space as a certain order in the community of substances and time as a dynamical sequences of their states. That which space and time seem to possess as proper to themselves and independent of things, he ascribed to the confusion of these concepts, which led to the fact that what is a mere form of dynamical relations was mistaken for a particular self-subsistent intuition. Uh, so, which led to the fact that what is a mere form of dynamical relations was mistaken for a particular self subsistent intuition antecedent to the things themselves. The space and time became for Leibniz the intelligible form of the connections of things in themselves. Nevertheless, he tried to make these concepts valid for appearances because he would not concede to sensibility any independent kind of intuition of its own. And so Kant is saying that uh, Leibniz uh, needed the, uh, sort of the intuition, sort of the space and time to be true of the things in themselves because uh, he couldn't concede to sensibility any kind of independent sort of intuition but ascribed all, even the empirical representation of objects to the understanding, leaving to sense nothing but the contemptible task of confusing and mutilating the representations of the understanding. Um, I I, know, I, I really like this line of Kant's. It's, you know, he's really dunking on Leibniz here, saying that, you know, our human senses are, are, uh, are nothing, have nothing but the contemptible task of sort of confusing and mutilating the representations of the understanding. So sort of, you know, Leibniz kind of, you know, talks about how we have this sort of uh, confused, uh, view of, you know, his sort of perfect, you know, uh, pre-established har harmonious monads and that, you know, our view of them is sort of this uh, platonic sort of bastardization of sort of these perfect idyllic uh, things. And so, uh, so Kant says that he's leaving to the senses nothing but the contemptible task of confusing and mutilating the representations of the understanding. And so uh, we could say, uh, I mean, Kant doesn't say that this is his conclusion, but I've sort of said that his conclusion is, uh, so what renders this critique of conclusions drawn by means of mere acts of reflection extremely useful is that it shows distinctly the nullity of all conclusions with regard to objects compared with one another solely in the understanding Appearances, though they cannot be included as things themselves among the objects of pure understanding, are nevertheless the only objects in relation to which our knowledge can possess objective reality. That is, where intuition corresponds to concepts. And so that is, you know, Kant essentially saying what I was talking about before, that, you know, if we have our, our object here, you know, and we're saying that, you know, it it is X and it, it is Y, uh, you know, and is Z, uh, that this is, you know, this is sort of an incomplete way of thinking about it. So uh, it shows distinctly the nullity of the conclusions with regard to objects compared with another 
solely in the understanding. So solely as just sort of, you know, a list of all the things that we can predicate of it, uh, and that we actually need appearances, which uses the intuition. So the space and time. Uh, so it is no doubt true that what generally belongs to or contradicts a concept also belongs to or contradicts every particular which is contained under it. Uh, and so that is what I was talking about before, where if we have the general, so say we have, you know, a breed of, of dogs, and so we want to sort of predicate, you know, all the sort of uh, things that belong to breed of dogs to dog X and dog Y. So anything contained in that particular breed of dog, so, you know, say it's, you know, German Shepherd, so we'd say that, you know, that it has, you know, big as part of it, that we would, we could say, you know, is, is big and is big. Uh, and so we could say those things of it. And so everything contained in here is uh, also contained in each of the particulars is what he's saying. Uh, but then he says, but it would be wrong to change this logical principle so as to make it say, whatever is not contained in a general concept is also not contained in the particular concept standing under it. Uh, and so he's uh, saying that we can't say because, you know, everything that is contained within breed of dogs is contained within each particular dog, that everything that is not contained within the breed of dogs is also not contained within each particular dog. And the reason we can't say that uh, is uh, for these are particular concepts for the very reason that they contain more than is thought in the general concept. Uh, and so I think I talked about in the sort of first video in this entire series that, you know, if we have a general concept of something uh, where uh, say the general concept is that it, you know, it contains two lines that look like this, then we want to look at two particulars. Each of those particulars will contain those two lines, but then they could also contain, you know, some, some other line in them like that. So they contain more than what is just in the general concept. Uh, they contain everything that is in the general concept, but we can't say that because it contains everything within the general concept that they contain nothing else but what's in the general concept. Uh, so Kant says, nevertheless, the whole intellectual system of Leibniz is built upon this latter principle uh, that, you know, a thing cannot contain more than what's in its uh, it's sort of a uh, general concept. And so his system and this principle collapse at the same time together with all ambiguity in the use of the understanding that had its origins in it. And so uh, I put here, in other words, an object or a specific concept must contain everything in the general concepts, i.e. the predicates that can truthfully be ascribed to it, uh, the individual, the complete individual concept, but can also contain more that is in the general concepts, such as the spatio-temporal location in the intuition. So down here, I uh, just kind of write out what I've been talking about with this dog example. So a dog contains all the predicates belonging to the general concept of mammal, but also contains more than just those uh, those predicates, uh, i.e. it also contains all the uniquely dog predicates. And a particular dog, say, the German Shepherd one street over that was barking last night contains all the predicates belonging to the general concept of dog, but also contains, but it is also in a particular spatio-temporal location, uh, namely, you know, the space, the spatial, spatial location of one street over, and you know, the temporal location of uh, barking last night, and so those are sort of. Uh, sort of unique things that make those speci that specific dog the specific dog that it is. Uh, and so Kant says, the Leibniz's principle of indiscernibles uh, is 
really based on the presupposition that if a certain distinction is not to be found in the concept of a thing in general, then it could also not be met with in the things themselves, and that therefore all things that are not already distinguished from one another by their concepts as to quality or quantity are perfectly the same. Uh, and so, yeah, this is, uh, like I said, 20 pages of Kant dunking on Leibniz uh, for what Kant sees as sort of this uh, ambiguity. So the ambiguity Kant is talking about is uh, Leibniz sort of uh, saying that everything falls under the, the understanding, the understanding, including, including, you know, things like space, space and time. Uh, but Kant is saying that this is not true, that we don't have this, uh, I guess, what the German idealists would call the uh, the intellectual intuition. So understanding being, you know, the intellectual. And that's why Kant calls, uh, calls Leibniz an intellectualist philosopher, because he wants this, uh, this sort of intellectual uh, intuition, intuition. And Kant is saying that, that Leibniz is wrong to say that there is this intuition that falls under the understanding uh, that, this, um, that this is actually, uh, so I'll cross that out, that this is actually under its own, its own faculty here, what that Kant called intuition. And so the amphiboly here is that that Leibniz is sort of trying to say that these things fall under the understanding and that we can have this sort of intellectual intuition. And so Kant is saying that that is, uh, that uh, Leibniz is incorrect in that. Uh, but anyway, this, as I said, is the uh, final video in this transcendental analytic. Uh, and in the next videos, uh, it'll probably be several videos. I'll be going over the transcendental dialectic, which is uh, essentially Kant pointing out, you know, that reason uh, is essentially trying to reach beyond what it can uh, and uh, that well, that we're not justified in being able to do that. And therefore, we have to sort of uh, impose these limits on what we can say that reason is justifiably allowed to do. But anyway, that will be uh, in the next several videos. So uh, I hope you found this video and all these videos on the Transcendental Analytic uh, helpful and interesting. And I will see you in the next video.